Hi everyone, this is Ms. Romani, and during this lesson we will talk about some of the scientists, some of the doctors, and some of the nurses who contributed significantly to the field of epidemiology and public health. And in order to really appreciate how far we've come, it is important to know where we started. And one place to start is by looking at how the average life expectancy has changed over the years. In 1820, the global life expectancy was less than 30 years old, and no country in the world had an average life expectancy above 40. Yet in 2019, the global life expectancy was approaching 70 years of age. Today, in developing nations, most of the deaths are happening amongst the elderly, while deaths in infancy and childhood are increasingly rare. This is arguably the most important single historical change of the last 200 years. In the past, the majority of people everywhere died from infectious diseases, as opposed to now, when most people die of degenerative diseases like cancers and heart disease. And by the way, this spike right here in 1918, that's the Spanish flu. Of course, we have not won the battle against infectious diseases. I mean, the past years test have been enough of that but we have made significant strides in combating their devastation. During 2020, COVID-19 became the sixth leading cause of death, beating out influenza and pneumonia, which in previous years were the only infectious diseases that made it into the top 10 cause of death in Canada. So how did we get here? How did infectious disease move so far down the list? The answer is advances in medicine, epidemiology, and public health. And some of the earliest works of epidemiology actually date back to ancient times. For example, in 400 BC, the Greek philosopher and physician Hippocrates of Kos attempted to explain disease from a rational rather than a supernatural view. He suggested that disease was caused by a variety of factors like the environment and behavior, and not by some supernatural intervention. Hippocrates is thought of as the father of medicine, and the Hippocratic Oath is actually a vow that doctors take to this day. And although epidemiology as a discipline really took off after the Second World War, the contributions made by various scientists and medical professionals during the 19th century made significant contributions to our understanding of the cause, the spread, and the prevention of disease. So we will focus on some of those individuals during this lesson. And let's begin not in the 19th century, but at the very end of the 18th century with the work of British physician and scientist Edward Jenner. Dr. Edward Jenner pioneered the concept of vaccines and created the smallpox vaccine, the world's first vaccine. Now I have to warn you, this next slide shows two pictures of children suffering from smallpox, and it can be a little bit disturbing. Smallpox was caused by the variola virus. Infection of the virus began with flu-like symptoms, but it progressed to a horrendous rash that consisted of deep sores that would crust and scab over, and with a mortality rate of up to 30%, many who contracted this disease died of it. Those lucky enough to survive were often left with horrible scars. So Dr. Jenner discovered that milkmaids got smallpox at much lower rates than the rest of the population. However, instead of smallpox, milkmaids often got an infection of cowpox, which is a much milder disease that they would often contract from the udders of cows. So Dr. Jenner guessed that getting cowpox was providing the milkmaids with protection against smallpox. He decided to conduct an experiment. So what Dr. Jenner did is he took some pus from a cowpox sore from a milkmaid's hand and inoculated it into the arm of James Phipps, the nine-year-old son of his gardener. The boy developed a mild fever and some discomfort after the inoculation. Months later, Jenner exposed Phipps several times to the variola virus but Phipps never developed smallpox. He had become immune to smallpox because of the inoculation with cowpox. More experiments followed, and in 1801, Jenner published his treatise on the origin of the vaccine inoculation. In this work, he summarized his discoveries and expressed hope that the annihilation of the smallpox, the most stressful scourge of the human species, must be the final result of this practice. Smallpox was one of the deadliest and most contagious diseases known to humankind. It killed nearly half a billion people in the 20th century alone. And I say was one of the deadliest diseases, because Jenner's hope did come true. The disease has been completely eradicated. 
meaning that it no longer is in existence anywhere in the world. The last known case of smallpox was diagnosed on October 26, 1977. Physicians started using Jenner's vaccination procedure in 1801, and less than 180 years later, in the year 1980, the World Health Organization declared smallpox eradicated. Oh, and here's a fun fact. The word vaccine literally means from a cow. Cow in Latin is vaca. And since the first vaccine was obtained from cowpox lesions, Dr. Jenner called the process vaccination and the product a vaccine. Now, let's go to the 19th century, and let's talk about the work of Jon Snow. No, not this guy. This guy. Jon Snow was a British physician who is now known as the father of epidemiology for determining the source of the 1854 Broad Street cholera epidemic in London. You see, in August of 1854, a cholera outbreak struck the city of London. Over 600 people died in just a few weeks. At the time, it was assumed that cholera, like all diseases, was caused by bad air, foul odors, or evil spirits. This belief was called the miasma theory. Dr. John Snow believed for a while that it wasn't bad air that was causing cholera, but instead that water contaminated by sewage was the cause of cholera. He published an article in 1849 outlining his theory, but doctors and scientists dismissed it and stuck with the popular miasma theory believing instead that cholera was transmitted through the air and not through water. A few years later, when the 1854 cholera outbreak struck in an area of London near where Jon Snow lived, he was able to prove his theory through a bit of detective work. When he mapped out the cases of cholera in the area and matched them up with the places where those individuals got their water, he found that every case of cholera could be linked to the Broad Street pump. So through careful investigation, Snow was able to identify a very specific water pump on Broad Street as the source of the disease. So on September 7th of 1854, John Snow took his research to the town officials and convinced them to take the handle off the pump, making it impossible to draw water. At first, the town officials were reluctant to believe him, but they went ahead and took off the handle of the pump anyways as a trial only to find that the outbreak of cholera almost immediately stopped once the people could no longer drink from the Broad Street pump. Further investigation eventually led Jon Snow to the source of the outbreak, a dirty diaper that had been dumped into a leaky cesspool just three feet from the Broad Street pump. The baby who had poopied that diaper had died of cholera. So Jon Snow determined that cholera was spread through a fecal oral root transmission and that infected water from the pump on Broad Street was to blame for that particular outbreak. John Snow's work represents an early epidemiological study and the first known public health response to an epidemic. His meticulous method of case tracking and investigation are now common practice in epidemiology. So modern epidemiology requires the type of active investigation that John Snow pioneered, and also careful data collection and analysis. And a pioneer of this type of data collection was British nurse Florence Nightingale. Florence Nightingale is revered as a founder of modern nursing, but also made substantial contributions to health statistics, in particular with the data she collected as a nurse during the Crimean War in 1854. During the Crimean War, Nightingale led a team of nurses to staff a hospital for the British Army. When Nightingale and her team arrived in Turkey in November of 1854, they found a hospital in terrible condition. The wards were overcrowded and filthy, patients were covered in rags soiled with dry blood and excrement, and the water supply and food was contaminated. According to Nightingale's statistics, the hospital fatality rate during the first months after her arrival was 40%. So she put her nurses to work sanitizing the wards and bathing and clothing patients. She also kept careful statistics. Florence Nightingale used math to improve health care. Before becoming a nurse, Nightingale studied and taught mathematics, so she used those skills to help prove the need for better hospital care and sanitation. Using statistics, she was able to track the number of deaths and the cost of those deaths. In her now famous graph, the one that you see here, she showed the number of hospital deaths each month as wedges. Within each wedge, the deaths that were due to the soldiers' war wounds were represented in red, but which appears pink in this diagram, and 
The gray areas of each wedge represented the deaths that were due to infectious diseases, like cholera or typhus, diseases that the soldiers were picking up at the hospital. And the brown areas in between represented deaths from other causes. Her record-keeping and data analysis illustrated that most soldier deaths were actually due to preventable infections rather than their wounds. In other words, the hospital was more deadly than the enemy. Within six months of her teen's arrival, the hospital case fatality dropped from 40% to 2%. And this type of data analysis would then become the science of epidemiology. Florence Nightingale's work also shows us the importance of sanitation in medical settings, which was further revolutionized by Dr. Joseph Lister, a British surgeon who is now known as the father of antiseptic surgery. In the mid-1800s, Joseph Lister initiated the use of a disinfectant called carbolic acid during surgeries. This practice significantly lowered post-surgery infection and death rates. Joseph Lister had always been aware that the number of deaths after surgery was not caused so much by the operation itself, but by what followed after the procedure. There was an alarming rate of what was then called ward fever after surgery, basically infections which killed about 80% of patients who underwent surgery. Lister started adding hygienic practices before conducting any operation. Simple things like making sure that his hands were clean and his clothes were fresh, which, believe it or not, at the time was revolutionary. It was actually pretty common for surgeons to walk around covered in blood, since this served as some type of status symbol for them. Lister was an early supporter of germ theory, at a time when miasma theory was still the common belief. He believed that to prevent infection, he had to find a way to kill germs before they got a chance to enter a wound. At the time, carbolic acid was being used as a disinfectant for sewers. So once he confirmed that it was safe to use on human flesh, Lister saw it as a solution to the problem. He started using it to wash his hands, as well as the instruments he needed in every operation. He also devised a machine that sprayed the air with carbolic acid in order to get rid of airborne germs. He refined his techniques until he had enough proof that everything he did was successful, and then published his findings in the medical journal The Lancet in 1867. It actually took a long time for other people in the medical field to accept Lister's findings. A lot of them did not believe that organisms too small to be seen were the cause of so much death. It took over a decade before Lister's system gained widespread acceptance, but once it did, the chances of dying from infection after a surgery decreased dramatically. Which brings us to one of the most significant advances in public health, the acceptance of germ theory. Joseph Lister can be credited with contributing to the acceptance of germ theory, but Joseph Lister was inspired by the work of this man, French chemist and microbiologist Louis Pasteur. In the 1860s, Louis Pasteur performed many experiments that finally convinced scientists that the germ theory of disease was correct. Germ theory had been proposed earlier, but had gone mostly ignored. Germ theory simply stated that infectious diseases are caused by microscopic organisms that must be transferred from one host to another in order to spread. Louis Pasteur is best known for inventing the process that bears his name, pasteurization. Pasteurization is a process that kills microbes and prevents the spoilage of milk, beer, and other foods and beverages. Louis Pasteur proved that food spoiled because of contamination by invisible bacteria and not because of spontaneous generation. His experiments basically demonstrated that in sterilized sealed flask, nothing ever grew and conversely, that in sterilized but open flasks, microorganisms could grow. In 1861, Pasteur published his germ theory, which proved that bacteria caused diseases. And later on, in 1881, he helped develop a vaccine for chicken cholera and for anthrax, which was successful in animals. Then in 1885, Louis Pasteur tested his first human vaccine, a vaccine against rabies. However, his experiments that led to the general acceptance of germ theory was probably one of his most important contributions to the field of public health. Acceptance of germ theory led to wide-scale changes in medicine, food preparation, sanitation practices, and waste disposal. Things that we take for granted today, but back then were new and life-changing. Ultimately, germ theory helped change the way doctors and other people thought of, reacted to, and prevented diseases. Additionally, it helped public health officials keep illnesses and germs from spreading throughout communities. Another scientist that directly provided proof for the germ theory of diseases was the German doctor and microbiologist Robert Koch. 
Koch developed many innovative techniques in microbiology. He developed a process to grow bacteria in a laboratory. And in the late 1800s, he was the first scientist to demonstrate the causative agent of a disease by discovering that the bacterium Bacillus anthracis was the cause of a deadly infection called anthrax. He later went on to discover the specific causative agents of other deadly infectious diseases, including tuberculosis and cholera. The methods that Koch used in bacteriology led to establishment of a medical concept known as Koch's postulates, four criteria which had to be met in order to positively link a disease with a pathogenic microbe. The postulates are as follows. First, in order to link a specific pathogen to a disease, the organism must always be present in every case of the disease, but not in healthy individuals. Second, the organism must be isolated from a diseased individual and grown in a pure culture. Third, the pure culture must cause the same disease when inoculated, which means injected, into a healthy individual. And fourth, the same pathogen must now be isolated from the individuals who were infected during the experiment. Koch's postulates brought about the golden age of microbiology. Between 1876 and 1906, many common diseases were linked with their causative agents, including cholera, diphtheria, gonorrhea, meningitis, the plague, syphilis, tetanus, and tuberculosis. Now let's fast forward a little bit to 1928 and the discovery of the first antibiotic by Sir Alexander Fleming. Sir Alexander Fleming was a Scottish physician and microbiologist. His work on wound infection and lysozyme, an antibacterial enzyme that is found in tears and saliva, had already guaranteed him a place in the history of medicine. But it was his discovery of penicillin, the first antibiotic, that sealed his reputation and earned him a Nobel Prize in medicine. Penicillin was discovered in London in September of 1928. As the story goes, Dr. Alexander Fleming was researching the properties of Staphylococcus aureus in the lab. One day, after returning from a summer vacation in Scotland, he found that some cultures of Staphylococcus he had meant to throw away had died while he was away. Upon examining the bacterial colonies, he noted that a mold had contaminated his petri dishes and had killed the bacteria that was growing in them. It took Fleming a few more weeks to isolate the active substance in the mold that inhibited bacterial growth, and he called it penicillin, after the name of the fungus. The introduction of penicillin in the 1940s began the era of antibiotics. World War II actually prompted a large-scale production of the drug, making this life-saving substance widely available to the population. Fleming also discovered that bacteria developed antibiotic resistance whenever too little penicillin was used or when it was used for too short a period of time. Interestingly, he was one of the first to warn us about antibiotic resistance. On June 26 of 1945, he made the following cautionary statement. The microbes are educated to resist penicillin and a host of penicillin-fast organisms is bred out. In such cases, the thoughtless person playing with penicillin is morally responsible for the death of the man who finally succumbs to infection with a penicillin-resistant organism. I hope this evil can be averted. He cautioned us not to use penicillin unless there was a properly diagnosed reason for it to be used, and that if it were used, never to use too little or for too short a time, since these are the circumstances under which bacterial resistance to antibiotics develop. Unfortunately, we did not heed his warning, and antibiotic resistance has become a serious concern for the future of modern medicine. So during this lesson, we have talked about the discovery of vaccines, the acceptance of germ theory and improved sanitation practices, and the discovery of antibiotics all of which have contributed to the significantly lower deaths due to infectious diseases we see today and to the incredible rise in life expectancy in the last 200 years. In the next lesson, you will learn a bit more about vaccines and how they work. Talk to you soon.